Um, my name's Tony Albrecht, and uh, I'll be um, presenting the answers to life's big questions, um, where I'll attempt to um, talk about a lot of things. Um, the reason I picked this topic was because when I saw the uh, GCAP call for speakers, there was one line in there which said, uh, um, which is the best multi-platform engine? And my initial thought was, who the hell would talk about something like that? It's too contentious, there'll be fights. And then the next morning I thought, I'm going to talk about that because it's contentious and there'll be fights. <laughs> so, but that's only one slide and that's a pretty quick talk. So uh, I've had to pat it out a little bit. So I had a few other questions that I threw in there that I thought would be fun to answer. Um, and some proved a little tricky. I had to do some research. So in order to make it a bit more fun for me as well, I thought I would answer a question that uh, um, had been bothering me for quite a while. Um, I've been doing a fair bit of uh, travel recently. Uh, I've been flying to and from LA for work, which is a lot of fun. But one of the things that uh, I've thought about, and I think everybody thinks about on a flight, is what's the frequency of flatulence on a given flight? <laughs> because I don't know about you, but when I'm on a flight, either I'm farting or somebody else is farting. So I thought it would be interesting to determine how much time is spent actually farting on a flight between here and LA. So let's work it out. An A380 seats between 525 and 853 passengers. So let's say 700, nice round number. Melbourne LAX is 16 hours, 22 minutes. That might be Sydney LAX, but regardless, let's, let's choose 982 minutes. The average person farts 14 times a day. Um, uh, produces about half a litre of gas. So it's 36 mils per fart, in case you were wondering, because these are the things I wanted to know. <laughs> average fart length is 1.2 seconds. I am so above average on that. <laughs> So we're looking at 16 hours, 20 minutes, over 24 hours, 14 farts per day. That's nine and a half farts per person per flight, which is 6,683 farts, or 8,000 seconds of farts. <laughs> so that means one fart, which is two hours and 13 minutes long, <laughs> or one fart every 8.8 .8 seconds. But, and you'll excuse, excuse the pun, <laughs> air pressure drops in the cabin from 101 <laughs> kilopascals to 75. It changes depending on what type of plane you're on, but around about 75 kilopascals. So 30% more farts, which means one fart every 6.8 seconds, or there's 5.6 seconds between each fart. So you think, as you're breathing in and out, every five and a half seconds, somebody else is farting. Now, in doing research for this, um, I come across some colourful websites um, and some interesting advice. One of them came from news.com.au, that bastion of fine reporting. <laughs> and they had some advice at the bottom on what you can do to deal with the fact that you fart more on a plane. They actually said, for people with weak, a weak pelvic floor, decoys can be performed, such as coughing, sneezing, verbal outbreaks, or spontaneous applause. <laughs> So, so if you're on a plane and somebody starts applauding, you know why. It's because they read news.com.au. So, war. Um, we've had wars and fighting since before there were humans. Uh, all it takes is the slightest disagreement, like how much melatonin someone has in their skin, or whose imaginary friend would win in a lightning bolt fight with somebody else's imaginary friend, and then the stone has come out and people start cracking skulls. Well, that's what they used to do. Now it's either an aerial, aerial bombardment from billions of dollars worth of flying steel, or people calling you a fucktard on Twitter and threatening to kill you. So basically, wars have been around forever, only the mediums in which they are enacted have changed. So. Back in the 80s and 90s, we had something called the Editor Wars. It was the two big editors at the time, Emacs and Vi. Okay. There was a, this was important to people back then. Um, Emacs was this uh, massive editor that did everything from read your mail. Uh, you could play games in it. Uh, it ran uh, a, a version of Lisp under the hood, so you could program in Lisp to do all your macros. Excuse me. 
Um, and then there was Vi, and Vi had two modes, uh, beep repeatedly and break everything. Um, <laughs> curiously, Vi was known as the editor of the beast, because Vi, 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 in Roman numerals, is 666. I had a lecturer, actually, who never used Emacs or Vi or anything else like that. He used a true line editor. He didn't have a terminal, he had a printer. So he would actually type directly onto the paper, and that's how he coded. He's dead now. <laughs> so nowadays, we don't suffer from the issues of, of you know, one or two editors that are fairly limited. There's a vast amount of stuff out there. There's Sublime Edit, Visual Studio, WebStorm, Eclipse, if you like cutting yourself, <laughs> or even MonoDevelop, if you like punching yourself in the face. Um, people tend to stick with an editor because they're familiar with it. It has momentum. You're used to it. You can do what you want to do. You can navigate. You can edit. You can manipulate. Once you can do that, why bother changing? You can do everything you need to do. The thing is, editors are evolving. Um, and the people that are willing to experiment with new editors stand to benefit. There was a time when every programmer in every studio that I worked in used Visual Studio. I was a late um, uh, user of Visual Studio. I was Emacs. I, I, all my PS2 programming was Emacs. I did my editing in there, compiling, debugging the works. And everyone else tried to use Visual Studio, but it wasn't connected in well. And our studio couldn't afford Code Warrior. Um, so that studio's gone now. So um, nowadays, when I walk around a large studio, I see people using Visual Studio. I see people using Sublime Editor. I see people using Vim if they want to. There's still a lot of opportunity out there, a lot of variance out there. My choice is Visual Studio at the moment, purely because it's what I'm used to. Uh, beginning of this year, I did a lot of JavaScript programming. and. Um, I end up using WebStorm, and it's a really good editor, even though it is written in Java. So yes, the answer to the best editor at the moment, I would say, is still Visual Studio. But IDEs are in for a big change. Uh, stuff like Swift is a small step in the right direction. Editors or development environments where you can actually code and have the code compile, change, parse, and you can visualize what's happening are long overdue. And somebody should write one so I can use it. Now. During this talk, some of the arguments I have here and some of the things I'm talking about uh, come down to ideology. Um, it's kind of what you think about it, your preconceived ideas and what, what, what makes you up or what makes you tick. Um, now, there's also dogma, which is you accept this as true because somebody important has said it, therefore it must be true, and you don't question it. For example, this presentation is correct, if you disagree with me, you are wrong. Dogma. It's also correct, though. One of the other ones, one of the questions I put up before also was, uh, what's the best game? So I had to think about that, and it's a hard choice to make. But imagine a game that is infinitely replayable, has emergent behavior, has source code available, built by a community rather than a studio over a period of decades. Can anybody think of a game like that? Yeah. NetHack, without a doubt. I started playing that back in uh, 87. I think I played NetHack 10F, and it was, yeah, brilliant. And it grew and evolved and became this incredible game that you can still play today. The graphics are ass, but that doesn't matter. What it does is it opens up your imagination. You don't see what's on the screen. You see the monsters. You see your pet dragons following you around. Um, you see the Medusa that you're fighting. It's, uh, it spawned, well, Rogue spawned the roguelikes obviously. But um, really, it spawned a whole genre of games. Even Diablo owes a lot to NetHack. Tabs versus spaces. It's an important question. And this isn't an ideological debate. Tabs before spaces is just wrong. OK. Um, you work for a studio as a programmer and your studio has a coding standard. It will prescribe exactly how many spaces you should have before for indentation. So you should be complying to that. The point of tabs is that you can theoretically change them to be whatever you want, to match your personal style. But you do get tab damage. It's a real thing. Uh, it just makes things untidy. So spaces are the answer here. Um, brace placement. Um, 
I always thought that there was just one solution to this. Now, consistency is the key thing. It's a coding standard problem. Um, okay, hands up who thinks the top solution is the correct one. Okay, what about the second one? Third one? <laughs> um, yeah, I would have gone with the second one, uh, and I generally do, unless you're programming in JavaScript. Because um, if you are returning, it, it, JavaScript does uh, automatic semicolon placement, uh, and it can break a code that's formatted to the Orman style, in particular returning uh, an object literal. Uh, if you don't use the KNR style, um, it can return, it will give you the wrong uh, return, which is something I didn't know. Um, I did some work for Insomniac, and my code was formatted incorrectly, and I was explained politely as to why uh, it was wrong. And yeah, interesting. Now, which programming language is best? <laughs> There's a lot of languages out there now. C, C++, Fortran, um, F, Scheme, Objective-C, Java, JavaScript, Assembly, COBOL, Prolog, so much out there. So many ways to hurt yourself. Um, languages are a means to an end. They are for translating your logic into a form that a specific computing di device can understand. They're a tool. Some devices will prescribe the languages that you can use, uh, but most will provide you with options, so you can choose the language that you want. But languages can and do change the way you think about a problem. A functional language versus a component-based solution or a, 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 an object-oriented language give you different ways of thinking about the problem. And experimenting with different languages opens you up to different ways of solving problems. Uh, and it's worthwhile spending time experimenting with Erlang or Lisp or C or C Sharp or JavaScript or anything else. I wouldn't do Java, though. Now, how you solve a problem depends on the tools you have at hand. Um, so you choose the language to suit your problem, not the other way around. A programmer should be able to express themselves in a number of different languages. If you're not fluent in a particular language, how can you argue against it? The reasons for using a particular language, uh, or, or almost anything, comes down to a few different areas. Familiarity and experience. If you've been writing in, in, in C Sharp for a long time, you know how to use that. You're not thinking, you're not looking stuff up in a manual, you're not searching um, uh, Stack Overflow trying to find a way of doing things. You can just do it. Your existing code base will prescribe the language or languages that you can use. Performance. If performance is a, uh, an important part of the, the problem you're trying to solve, then the language that you use should be performant. It'll help guide what you need to be using. Ease of development. Um, you may want a, um, a script, which is really the next one, iteration time. How long it takes you for you to make a code change and actually see the final program change is a critical part of development. That iteration time needs to be as short as possible. So the choice of language isn't what's the best language, it's what's the best language for the task I have at hand. Having said that, the best language is C++. <laughs> it's also the worst language, depending on how you use it. So, dark theme or light theme? Dark, obviously. The reason is, if you use a light-themed light IDE, then you're, there's more pixels that are on, so you're using more power and you are actively contributing to climate change. <laughs> and I'm personally responsible, along with Tony Abbott, for the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> This one I put in, uh, I thought it'd be fun to, to, to answer, to be or not to be. So I had a bit of a think, I did some research, and if you look at it <laughs> from a bitwise point of view, it's false. But logically, it's true. So applying code to it didn't really help much. So I had to look at the cliff notes for Hamlet, because I really didn't feel like reading it, and I read Macbeth, not Macbeth, Hamlet, a long, long time ago. So, some background for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Shakespeare's works. Prince Hamlet uh, has been told by the ghost of his dad that his dad's brother, Claudius, is the murderer of his dad. So his uncle's killed his dad. 
and by pouring poison into his ear, which is weird. Um, now, Claudius not only murdered the king, but he's also shacked up with the king's wife, the queen, and has taken over the kingdom. So Hamlet has been told by his dad to kill his uncle, who's sleeping with his mum. Now, Hamlet is a contemplative, quiet sort of guy and is worried about if he commits murder, then he's committing a sin and he'll be sent to hell. And he's kind of a bit distraught and is worried about, you know, maybe he should commit suicide as well. But that's also a mortal sin. So he wasn't too sure what to do, hence the to be or not to be. Then things get messed up. Uh, there's a play about murder, which is inside a play about murder. There's more murders, there's spies. We meet Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, there's mistaken stabbings, poisons, more murder until pretty much everyone's dead and no one lives happily ever after. So the answer, um, Hamlet chose to be, which I think was the right answer. So it's a logical to be or not to be, not the bitwise. Now, which game engine's best? We got security? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a uh, show of hands. Uh, who thinks Unreal? Hmm, not many. A few, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, what about the CryEngine? Crytek solution. Oh, yep, we got. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, what about Game Maker? <laughs> yeah, Game Maker. Yeah. Game Brio? <laughs> yeah, it is that bad. Um, or Unity? Okay. Uh, I chose. This image for Unity because it's, it's a friendly vehicle, everyone likes it, and it tends to win a lot. Um, what about DIY? Who's built their own engine? Well, we have a few. Oh, oh, I like this crowd. And I love that photo. That guy looks so proud, doesn't he? <laughs> now, often when I say to people, you know, I've built my own engine, or, you know, you should build your own engine, people say, no, next. That no one should ever build their own engine. It's stupid. You know, it's a waste of time. And my response, the next time it happens, will be... <laughs> so, yeah, I've been practicing that. <laughs> Now, this is um, a game called Resogun, done by Housemark. Uh, it's their own engine, runs on PS4, and it is the only game I've seen running on that console that looks like a next-gen game. It's their own engine because nothing else can do what they do. The sheer number of particles visible in this thing is astounding. Um, the guys, it's because they live in Finland, where there's no sun most of the time and alcohol's really expensive, so what else are you gonna do? <laughs> so, I think building an engine is a valuable exercise for a programmer. Every programmer should build at least one. It can be a hobby uh, thing, which I thoroughly recommend. Gives you a better understanding of how engines work. Uh, you have an immense sense of pride once it's working. And if built correctly, your ability to enhance, optimize, and extend it is second to none. You can build a game around a key feature of your engine, produce something that no one else has seen to date. But it's very time consuming. Uh, you generally not, need not just an engine, but an editor, an asset pipeline, and all the convenient things you get from things like Unreal and, and Unity. Um, now, many studios build and maintain their own engines and are very successful with them. Um, they have complete control over it, uh, and they have complete responsibility. A lot of the larger studios do build their own engines because it gives them all that control they need. But smaller ones can too, and, and, and also be successful, hence, Steve from Minecraft. So, which engine is best? It's like the Editor Wars. Engine Wars are very ideological. I tried to find a good photo of Holden's versus Ford's with some bogans in it, but I couldn't find anything decent. So, there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of passion. Um, people believe that what they use is the best because that's what they use. But the question is, best at what? It's best for what? What can I do with this? What is it best at? It's a tool. Now, I'm not talking about just building your own game based on your own concept. I'm talking about doing something to spec for somebody else. How do you choose which en engine to use? 
both Unity and Unreal are excellent solutions, but there are other things out there that may be better solutions for your problem. So I went through and I looked at a number of questions that I can ask yourself. Excuse me, I shouldn't have had that coat beforehand. Um, you need to ask yourself some questions to help yourself choose which engine you want to use. So the first one is, how much? What's it cost? Is it free? Um, is it an outright purchase, one-off? Is it a purchase per platform? Um, is it royalty-based? Uh, is it a, a monthly fee? Can I afford it? Uh, if, as a, a starting up indie, you may not be able to afford anything, so you want a free solution. Or you want to pirate one and do what you're in. No, I didn't say that. Um, it, it, so yeah, how much does it cost? It will affect what your choice is. Um, what do you get for your money? Um, do you get an editor? Um, do you get source code? Um, is there an art pipeline associated with it? Uh, is there support? Um, what platforms does it support? I mean, these are things you need to be, be aware of. Now, when I was at GDC earlier this year, um, I, I, Epic made an announcement. And Unreal, which was about a bajillion dollars plus your firstborn child <laughs> once the game was released, they changed it. It became $19 a month, 5% royalty, which is great. If you don't sell anything, it's not going to cost you any more. And it came with source. And that is astounding. Me, like pretty much every other dev, had this reaction. <laughs> How awesome is that? <laughs> so I got it on loops. So I can just watch it over and over again. Yeah, it was amazing. Like Providing source to an engine of that quality is just amazing. Um, yeah. Now, what platforms does the game support? Does the engine support? Um, that's critical. If you're writing a game for iOS, it needs to support iOS, obviously. Um, if the engine doesn't support your platform, do you have the ability to actually add support for a new platform? If you want to be an early adopter of a new Chinese console, you can't rely on Unity to have done the work for you. You're going to have to do it yourself somehow. It will prescribe which engine you can use. Is it powerful enough? Now, performance is important. You can, you'd like the freedom to be able to add what you want to your game without concern of performance. But, and some games, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, you can do a lot with known limitations. Um, you can design around them and you can use smoke and mirrors to hide them. For example, I did a, um, I worked on a game for a publisher and uh, it was a free roaming GTA style game. And we had our own skinning system and whatnot in there. And we had to limit the number of pedestrians that were visible at any one time. Uh, so we had about a dozen on screen at once. And as you moved around, you'd see another dozen over there. So it looked like there was 40 people around you, which is pretty cool. We showed it to the publisher, who we were quite proud. And they said, no, 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 we want 150 people visible at once. Which means you've got 400 people standing around you. It's going to be so crowded, you can't do anything. But anyway. You can, our engine couldn't support that. So we couldn't do 150, which was a stupid idea anyway. That publisher doesn't exist anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> um, what it comes down to is a trade-off between convenience and performance, okay? You can make things work um, by using smoke and mirrors, by carefully crafting and optimizing your assets and code path and everything else. But ideally, you just want to be able to do it and it works. Um, but limitations within games are also exceptionally good. They can help you focus your design to the things that are really important. Functionality. Um, does it provide you with physics? Do you need physics? Do you need AI? Does it provide you with tools for building AIs? What graphics does it do? Um, how performant are those graphics as well? Uh, what audio solutions are there for you? Um, there's also platform-specific stuff you need to worry about, like does it handle save games? Does it handle cloud saves? Does it do uh, network scores for you? Does it do all the stuff that, um, like if you're doing stuff for, for, for PlayStation, for example, there's a whole range of things that you need to conform to in order to get, to get past submission. Does it do all those things for you? Um, otherwise, you're doing them yourself, and that can be incredibly painful. Another question, do you really need coders? This is an ease of use question, basically. Can you have game designers sit down and use this tool to produce a game without expensive programmers? 
it, it happens. Not very often, but it happens. And the games are always shit. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, so yeah, do you need coders, or can you have smart artists and programmers put it together? It's possible. Language. Can anyone tell me why I chose this image? Yes. Very good. Um, if you're using coders, what language are they most comfortable with? That's, that's important. Uh, what language do you have to program in to use that particular tool? Is it C++? Is it C Sharp? Is it JavaScript? Is it Goal? Goal was a solution, a language built by the Naughty Dog programmers uh, on PS2. It was game-oriented assembly Lisp, which sounds like Frankenstein, but and it actually kind of was. That's what it looked like. Um, this was a language that was designed by one guy. He also built the compiler for it, and it ran on the console so that you could change your code, hit a button, send it across to the PS2. It would recompile locally and then run that. So your iteration time was basically nothing. Um, but every programmer that came to Naughty Dog at the time had to learn how to program in Go. They had to change to a, a, a functional language at a time when C was the, oh, and C++ were the key languages. So, I mean, I, I remember looking at the, uh, the, the, the executables produced by this stuff, looking at um, uh, Jack and Daxter on a, a performance analyzer which was like a giant PS2 with lots and lots of wires stuck in it that let you look at every single part of it. It was phenomenal. They had the utilization of the processes in that was just astounding. And nobody else came close to what they were doing. But who else was smart enough or had the time to build their own language to take advantage of that system? No one. So iteration time is a critical component as far as how you choose your game engine. So how long does it take from when you change a line of code to when you can see it in game at the point where it's important? That time there is, will dictate how long it takes you to produce the full game itself, or how many features you have in the game, or how good the game is. So what about assets? If you change a bit of art, how long does it take for that to ripple through and appear in game? I've worked on games which have taken a weekend to get a final piece of art through, um, which includes all sorts of lighting solutions and, and craziness. Um, I've worked on games which have their own built-in editor, which allow you to do instant modification of game objects. I've also worked on games which take 45 minutes to compile um, and to get your changes through. Uh, it really slows you down. Both Unity and Unreal provide pretty good solutions for doing um, fairly quick iterative changes. I still don't think it's there yet, though. Um, does anyone? No, nah, that's right. I'll carry on. <laughs> asset pipeline. What asset pipeline is provided by the engine? Uh, can you chuck in a TIFF or a GIF or a JPEG or a PNG or whatever else and have it just suddenly work? Can your artists dump out something in whatever format they like and have it go through? Or do you have to prescribe that? Most of the engines I've seen handle pretty much everything. But you know that's audio, um, it's uh, animation, uh, images, everything. So that's a question you'd ask yourself as well. Now, another important question: What happens when something goes wrong? Um, what's the, does does the cost of the engine include support? Support is important. Now, I had some discussions on Twitter with people um, a while back, and I had one friend tell me that. Um, he demands that he has crowd support because um, basically the Unity support was too shit. Uh, so you're relying on the crowd to give you support. I mean, the people that use it are smart and they, have, they can help you, but they can't fix things that are broken. You have to rely on the producer of the engine itself to fix those problems. If you've got the source code, you can dive in yourself and you can have a look, you can see what's going on and you can fix it. For example, I was doing some work for a client, and they're using Scaleform, which is a horrible API and system for doing UE. Um, but it's, it's commonly used. And I, didn't, I was looking at, at how um, some of this stuff was being set up, and I didn't have a clear indication of the memory usage patterns for this stuff. So the documentation had no information on it. 
um, and I had no way of telling, but we had the source code. So I could then delve down into the source code, have a look and find out exactly what it was doing and work out what memory patterns it was using and, and uh, program it appropriately. So source can help there. Um, but you can't be good support from the, the developer of the engine itself. Now, scalability. This is one that people miss uh, quite often. If you have to deal with a large team, does the engine work well with a large team? Can a number of people work on the same level at the same time? Or are you limited to one person at a time doing different things? Um, how well is revision control integrated within the system? Um, so also, does the game, do you intend to grow the scope of the game and with it your team? Where you want to end up is important. The wrong choice at the start means that you get a, um, a Romero solution, which is like uh, uh, Duke Nukem, which started off in one engine and then ended up with another engine, ended up with another engine, and then ended up with a piece of shit that came out at the end that was awful. Your choice of engine, depending on how long you spend, intend to maintain the game, is important. So, extensibility and portability. If the engine doesn't do what you want, how hard is it to make it do what you want? Or should you even be doing that? You can constrain your game to work within that, but if you're doing a game to spec for somebody else, or an application to spec for somebody else, how hard is it to make it do what you want? Key thing is familiarity. I don't know what it's got to do with familiarity, I just like the picture. <laughs> Quite scary, isn't it? Um, what's your team most comfortable with? Um, and this is the thing that tends to win out. Um, whether it's language, whether it's editor, whether it's an entire game development environment, what's the team most comfortable with? What do they have the most velocity with? Um, can you afford to shake things up? Uh, a thorough understanding of your tool set cannot be underestimated. And the cost of learning a new tool, new tool set is high. It's risky. Um, the point at which you change to an unfamiliar engine should be well, the, the point at which you have to change to an unfamiliar engine is well past that point where the engine you're using has become uh, surpassed by something else. Um, so you're behind the eight ball. Um, so which engine's best? Um, well, all the questions that I've put up are things you need to ask yourself. Um, in most cases, you'll choose the one you're most familiar with. And, and that's... It's a business for most of us. Uh, it's a passion, it's a hobby, but it's a business. You need to choose something that's going to get you that product finished as soon as possible. Uh, there will come a time where you'll need to move on to somewhere else. Um, say, for example, um, a new CEO comes along and takes over a company and then decides to sell it. You know, that could happen. <laughs> I'm not saying it will. Okay, and not that I've worked for a company that a particular CEO came and took over and then shut down. That's, that's neither here nor there. I'm not, not bitter. <laughs> that company doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is um, there will come a time where you'll need to move on to something else. You need to keep your eyes open. You need to be looking around. You need to be aware of your alternatives. You need to look at different solutions and different ways of thinking of solving the problems that you, you have to solve. There's not one engine to rule them all, no more than there is one language or one game, except for, you know, NetHack. <laughs> so the best engine is the one you're using, until it isn't, which can happen. Um, I'll also say that um, I think the best engine is probably the one that you built yourself. But that's incredibly time consuming. Um, it's not something that I would recommend as a business strategy. Um, it's costly, it's risky, uh, it's a luxury. So assuming you don't have infinite time and money, um, I would go with the engine that I'm most familiar with, which would be Unity. Because um, it's easy, it's quick, it's got a lot of support, there's a lot of people around, that's what I would go with. So the point I want to make with this talk is that developers should not only become an expert in the tools that they usually use, but should regularly be looking around at other solutions and other options. Keep your minds open for other ways of doing things. Don't succumb to the ideology of one true engine. Embrace them all, learn from them all, and in your spare time, build one of your own from what you've learned from others, and then sell it and make billions of dollars. <laughs> but if you're building your own engine, remember this. 
Press a button. There. Some of the best games ship on the worst engines. And some of the best engines never ship games. And this is the end of my talk. <laughs> I had fun finding these gifts. <laughs> is that acting brilliant? <laughs> and the way the, the, the bullet holes magically appear at the wrong times. <laughs> So do we have any questions? And does anyone want to argue with me about any of my answers? Yes. I don't want to argue. <laughs> um, so you obviously said you should try building your own engine. Yes. I'm not really considered just because I don't really know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, do you have any suggestions on where I could start? Pick a, a small thing that interests you. It could be vector maths. Uh, it could be uh, doing some basic, uh, what I have done previously and what I started, um, I, I came to the first uh, Australian Game Fellow Conference back in 1999, and what I brought with me was a little floppy disk, and on it was my little engine, which was OpenGL based, and it did stuff, okay? Um, that's a great way to get started, is you take something which is uh, a fairly high level API to do some, some rendering, uh, and you build on that and grow that. And then you think, well, actually, I can do that better. So then you kind of write that yourself and then realize that you can't actually do it better, but you've learned from it and you understand how that works. Building your own engine is an invaluable experience. Uh, it is very time consuming. Uh, I think um, that students should be taught how to write their own engines in, in their, their uni courses. When I went through uni, I actually had to build a compiler. Um, and that was harrowing. Um, that was a procedural type compiler. But we also did one on Miranda, which was only 15 lines long. But that's kind of cheating and you can't do much with it other than Miranda because who's ever written anything in Miranda? Who's heard of Miranda? Right, just the old guys and the young one. <laughs> no, so, um, yes, uh, I would just start off with a simple, um, oh, what, what interests you? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can say, well, I want to write an engine for a game. You need to have a game that you're going to build with it, OK? So you think, OK, I did a little 2D thing. So then you start some stuff like that, and you start writing some physics systems for it. You write some rendering stuff for it. You start doing some AI stuff. You read lots of things, and you slowly skill up. And after, you know, six, seven years, you've built an engine. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like that. Um, yes, other questions? Yes. No. Writing your own asset pipeline, you might use some DevIL or something to bring it in. Look, whatever. yeah. Um, so I was wondering, there's kind of a middle ground between building, rolling your own and using Unreal and Unity. So I guess like maybe XNA would be an example of that, where you kind of, you're more responsible for what holds all the bits together, but you don't write all the bits yourself. So I was wondering if there's any, any bits of engine like that that you would want to you would recommend? Or um, most of the engines I've built have been for console. And there hasn't been, there's an API for doing stuff, um, which in a lot of cases is not a very good API, but you work with what's there. Um, XNA is, uh, you know, something you can use. Uh, it, really, it's, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a rabbit hole. You start, you're using an engine, you think, gee, I could do something like this. And you start building a component-based component, uh, component -based engine, for example. And then you think, oh, OK, that's deeper, and I need to do this thing here. And then you end up drifting over and doing some form of bizarre AI stuff. And at the same time, you're doing some, some physics stuff over there and some math things. You learn a huge amount. It broadens your area, area of expertise. And what it does is it helps you understand the other engines so much better um, and kind of why they've made certain decisions, the way they've done things. But yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, something like XNA is a, is a place to start. I mean, yeah, OpenGL is a nice, simple API that's most platforms you can play with as well. Um, and it's on mobile too, so you can do, do all sorts with it. Monogame. Monogame is a good Okay, yeah. There you go, Monogame. Yeah. Did you do a calculation to find out how many letters you maintain? About 250. 
Yeah. But it, that's a bit larger as well because of the pressure gradient, so you could probably add 30% to that. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Oh, yeah, you're right. You're after an exclusive Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I stand corrected. So the answer's true. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, are we done? Oh, one more. Uh, I'm just wondering, have you seen any of the talks by John Blow recently about the proposition of a new uh, programming language specific to games? Um, and if you have any thoughts on that kind of thing? No. Right. Cool. We're done. Thank you.